Hello there, I'm Marg Hemsley and once again I would like to welcome you to our event planning and risk management session. Today we're going to bring it all together on week six. Our journey so far has taken us from event planning and determining context through the funding avenues, marketing and promotion, managing liability and managing volunteers. Today's topic is writing your risk management plan to the Australian standard. This is where all the information we've discussed in the past few weeks all becomes relevant. Today's program fits very well into my area of professional advice as I'm a certified professional risk manager, so I'm well qualified to guide you in developing your plans. And if you've got any questions that come up through this broadcast, more than happy to answer them at a later date. I hope you've all downloaded the assessment checklist and the risk appetite and tolerance documents that Rosalind sent out to guide us through this session. You will also need a pen to take some notes. And if you haven't got the documents, you'll still be able to participate with your notepad and your pen. And afterwards, obviously, if you haven't got the documents, please contact Ros to get them. What I'm going to do is go through a process that I professionally use to assess whether plans are written in accordance with the principles and practices of the Australian Standard for Risk. While doing that, I'll outline for you what should be in place and where you may get the information from. It's a very interesting thing when you're assessing these risk management plans that most people get the risk register right. What they don't get right is the information about their own organisation, governance and their management risks. So we'll be spending a bit of time on that today. What you can do is to consider the information that you may have in or that you have ready to go into your plan as we go along and note down things that you need to work further on or information you need to find. You can, of course, jot down any questions that arise that you need to ask other people and submit it either to them uh, by email, to ROS, or however that you need to get the information if you have troubles, as I said before, here to guide you. So let's start on our PowerPoint and uh, this will guide us through the process and I will try to explain as much as possible along the way, but at the close of this, you should be able to establish your risk management plan. So we're going to start off today's topic by going through the Australian standard. We have talked an awful lot about it through these programs, but haven't spent much time actually looking at it. Then we'll have a look at the rationale for your risk management plan. We'll step through the process, and then I will tell you at the end what makes a good plan. So let's kick it off. The Australian standard has a history since 1996. It was the first country um, in the world, Australia was, to actually develop this sort of standard. There were some 27 different standards around the, the world before this, mostly based on financial risk and obviously hazard-based risk. So there was a process that went uh, on in 2008 and 9 with worldwide consultation and it was led by Australia and they used the concepts of the previously known risk management standard and built on that to include governance and management and continuous improvement. What was developed was the ISO 31000, which is an international standard, but in recognition of the contribution that Australia made, we in Australia are allowed to get it from our own standards association and it is badged AS stroke NZS ISO 31000, obviously developed in 2009. And this is the current Australian standard. You may find a lot of documentation that quotes 4360, AS NZS 4360. That was the preceding standard. The actual principles of the risk management process are the same, but the governance aspect is missing from that one. That's why we don't see very much of the governance in the risk management plans yet. So it's not auditable. Um, this checklist that we're talking about is not about how you go through it step by step. This is just validating the sort of things we expect to see and it's process driven. So it should be in your organisation, not something you tick a box to comply with. And it represents best practice in governance and risk management. So that's a real good fallback for your organisation if your policy states that you use this process and then you actually do. So what does it look like? Let's have a look at this following slide and you will see the components. On the right hand side, there's a table which is actually stepping through the process and we've talked quite a lot about determining the context. That was the key difference between this process and other risk management standards around there, that a lot of time is spent in the first box in the middle there of determining the context. That's really scoping what you're doing, why you're doing it, what you have to comply with. The other steps are really to just identify the risks, analyse them against a, a standard, which we're going to talk about later, 
uh, determine if you're going to accept the risks or treat them, and then you actually keep the risks and monitor them, or else you put treatments in place and then you monitor the outcomes. The two bars that are down the side of there, one is about communicating all the way through the process with the right people, and the other one is at each point monitoring where you're going. The section in the middle is all about governance, and it's about making sure that your organisation has a mandate to do risk management, and that's usually in the form of a policy. The policy just merely states that your organisation will do all its activities relating to the principles and practices of 4360, um, Big pardon, 31,000, I've fallen back into the same trap. Uh, and then that you will resource those activities and take them seriously. You then have to make sure that it's in place, it's communicated, you use it, and going around that circle, the last part is you continually improve your processes. So it's a positive activity, it's not a negative activity when you use this, um, this standard. So that's the principles and practices that we're actually trying to uh, look to. When we look at a risk management plan, the rationale for having a risk management plan is that it will guide you through the process of two things. One is organising your event, and the second is looking and identifying the, the risks all the way through from the beginning of the process right through to when you actually hold your event and review it afterwards. The secondary point is it lets other people see that you've done due diligence. Due diligence meaning you've done the best you can, looked at all the aspects, and uh, had all the good faith in the world that you're doing things safely and in the right way. It puts on record your intent of what you're going to do for your event and who's involved in that event. Now you'll remember when we were talking about the liability issues, sometimes it could be 8, 10, 15 years later somebody's going to come back with a case and if you haven't got everything on record of what you did on that day, it's very hard to defend. So that's another positive thing for your risk management plan. It clarifies the roles and responsibilities not only of people in your organisation, but of everybody who's got anything to do with it. Not the least being all of the other bodies around an event, which are the emergency response people, your local shire, residents, all of those people. It's trying to work out what role everybody has in this and what contingencies that you have to look at and what risks that might evolve. So you don't have to be the expert in everything if you've actually clarified that that role has been delegated to somebody else but you do have to make sure that they're taking their responsibilities seriously. It provides information, not the least for the person who's assessing your risk management plan, because to be able to assess a risk management plan, you've got to understand all about the event, what's going to go on there, where it's being held, what time of the day it is, lots of different um, aspects there. Most of them are not found in a risk register. It just tells you what's going to happen to the activities at the event, and that's where we find most of the risk management plans don't pass muster. So the other thing that it should do is have contact details for all people involved because that risk management plan should be an active document on the day of the event as well as leading up to it and post-event so that there is immediate contact details for anybody connected to any part of the program. And should issues arise in the future, it's obvious that's where that information will come from as well. But more importantly, as you're experiencing now from Events Core and some other funders, that they're looking for assurance that you've done your risk management processes properly. And this document will be able to demonstrate to anybody who's got any stake in your event that you're on the ball with your risk management plan. So that's what we're looking for when we go through that sort of information as well as the actual risks that have been identified in the treatments. What we're not going to do uh, when we look at risk management plans is actually determine whether the treatments that you've put in place are the correct treatments. Without having the full context of that, that is a whole different assessment. We're looking here in the principles and practices of the Australian standard. But one thing that I caution you with is to make sure that this risk management plan is about your event and your event only. We call it in the industry a fit for purpose risk management plan. And one size does not fit all in risk management plans. It really must be tailored to your own environment. Even year to year, you really need to go back and check it. Many of the attributes will be the same if you've got an ongoing event, but things may change. And sometimes you find if you add an extra day or, or into the evening or things like that, the actual different environmental issues come about. So be clear, every time you're doing a risk management plan, it's for that current event for that current year. So let's have a look and see where you are at with your plans and we'll go through the assessment process. On the screen right now, you will see a form 
that's used, uh, that I use personally in my business for assessing whether a risk management plan is written to the principles and practices of the standard. Now obviously that's very difficult to read, so that is why um, out, you were sent out a form so that you could follow. And you'll notice that there are some columns in there. The criteria that I use when assessing these plans is that yes, it complies. It complies in part. Sometimes there's some parts of it that are good and you're just missing a few bits. Or it could be no or it could be not applicable because certain things are not happening at your event. And then the larger column there on the right hand side is for comments. Now generally what I do is assess a risk management plan and then I will send it back to the people and say here is my opinion on where you're at at the moment and very often uh, especially for community groups or people doing this for the first time they really haven't got a handle on a lot of these things. So in the comments, I will then put a lot of suggestions of things that could enhance their plan and where they might possibly get the information. So your task for today is when you've got this form and just think of one of the events that you may be running or propose to run and then you can write some comments down in this side yourself as to the sort of information that you might have to find and where you might find it. So let's kick off with the categories. The first category is the governance and mandate. Do you remember on the standard that was that middle column which says the organisation has to demonstrate that you're committed to risk management, that this isn't a tick box exercise. So the very first thing that you will see on your um, uh, checklist uh, is organisation accountable for the event is clearly articulated with key contact details. That means that what we want to see in that particular area is that we want to see the name of the organisation whether you're an incorporated body, whether you're a community resource centre, whatever the actual structure and the commercial structure of your event, uh, of your organisation is. This is not about the event, this is about the organisation. We also want to see the name of the person in charge. We want to see uh, where the address of the, of the organisation is and any other relevant details about your organisation. So the first thing we're looking for here is who is accountable for this event. The organisational committee to risk management is demonstrated. So we want to actually see somewhere that there are the words, um, our organisation is committed to risk management and we use the um, principles and practices of the standard, preferably. But even just hearing that you're committed to risk management in all activities is, is a good start. We need to see some evidence of appropriate management and insurance arrangements by the event organiser. That generally means what sort of committee structure you've got, um, what sort of uh, management processes you're going to use to use things and we definitely want to see the insurance arrangements for your organisation. In this part, this is sometimes um, people just think about the public liability but you've also got other issues. You've got employees, as we've talked before, you've got volunteers. So you've got safety and health, workers' comp, all of those things. So you'd be wanting to outline your insurance um, details, which would include your insurer, a policy number, and the amount that your insurance covers. We want to see evidence of ongoing improvement as well. Remember, we're working away around that circle of that middle, middle column. And we want to see that if it's a repeat event, how did you look back at the last event? And did you identify anything that needs changing for this event? or what would be your processes. If it's the first time, we need you to be outlining that you will be monitoring what's going on and looking for opportunities for improvement. And then the other last section on that governance and mandate part of the questionnaire is compliance to local and relevant laws is demonstrated. So this is where you might indicate that you've had uh, your staging uh, approved by the local council, your food laws are, are being adhered to and um, such like. You, you could put things in here also, such as the um, liaison with the traffic management people. That has a couple of different places it could go, but it's more a general statement that you're complying rather than the individuals. That more comes in your risk management plan. Once you've got all that sort of stuff in place, we know who you are, we know actually um, that you're covered by insurance, we know who's in charge, we, we want to know, did it go well last time and are you compliant? So those little diagrams that you see on the, um, on the PowerPoint screen there, they're kind of the questions from the person in charge of the event as to are you guiding everybody else but have you also looked after your home first? What's our position on risk management is the most important thing that we want to also see. 
Okay, the next um, section that we come to is determining context. Now we have talked about this at the workshop and a few times along the way. So we want to know things like where is the event being held, when's it being held, uh, what's going to happen, who's involved, why are we doing the event and how is it going to be managed. So all of that stuff there um, is something that will be the next part of your plan. So going back to our form, what we will have now is that we will be saying, can we see the event date? And is there a program timeline? So if it goes over many days, what's happening on each day? Remember, we're looking for the principles and practices, but also this is going to guide you into doing your risk treatment plan and your, and your risk management plan uh, in context of the activities. So for us, again, to assess whether we think that you've done a reasonable job at looking at the right things, we need to see these things. We want to know the event objectives. Why are you holding this event? Remember the determining context form that we've spoken of in, in uh, the earlier weeks? This is where this becomes relevant. What's the target group? The risks are associated with an event will change drastically whether you're having your event for young people, for older people, children, families or whatever. They, they have a different set of risks. We want to know who the stakeholders are. So you would have a, a table in your plan that would outline all of the stakeholders. And what stake do they have in the event? What are their responsibilities? So that would just be one listed thing. A table is quite easy because you can actually then incorporate something else we'll be looking for, which would be the contact details. So one table would fix all of those. We want the location of the site. Who owns the site uh, facility? Or the, so it could be the council if it's a site. If it's a building, it could be a certain um, organisation, sports association or such like. And we want to know if the property owners are known. Remember when we talked about the risks that the landlords of those places have some liabilities as well. So we need their contact details uh, to be on record as well. And quite clearly, the event activities need to be outlined. That, that will all give us the context again, looking through to find out whether the risk management means anything for anybody who has a stake in looking at it. And that's not the least your insurers. A good risk management plan can sometimes help you with the costs of your insurance. So they want to actually understand what's going on. Next thing we do, we start to identify the risks. And this becomes quite an interesting exercise just in the doing of identifying the risks. When we're going down now the box that was on the right hand side, we've got the context of the, of the event, we're now going to identify the risks. So you use a thing called brainstorming. Now the most important thing when you're doing this part of your risks is actually not getting too much into the detail. You're just going to actually throw up a whole lot of words on a whiteboard or on post-it notes or whatever of what concerns us about things. And then when you've got all those things put down, the next question to ask is, have we got controls in place already? So if we, start, if we were talking about an ongoing event and we say we've got some really serious risks of uh, pedestrians being hit by cars when they're trying to set up in the uh, event itself, but you've got a full-blown traffic management plan internally and externally, you would say, yes, it's a risk, we've got something in place and concentrate on the things that you haven't got in place. So the next thing we, we come to then is, are they under control? Do we still have problems or do they need treatment? So once you've got all your risks together, you would cluster them into the things you've got under control, similar things, and then you will come up with a section of things that are still what, what on this diagram we call a problem. Now that problem is not always about a hazard. Sometimes it's about have we got enough money, for example, if we're talking about organisational risks as well as um, the risks that, that have some hazards. So then you come up with the options of what you're looking for and then you come up with uh, the um, contingency plans that you can put in place. So in the section on our assessment, it will say, has an initial risk assessment been carried out on all activities, the venue, access and egress, which means coming and going, obviously, and emergencies that may arise. So in your identifying risks point of view, it's much more than the hazards. You should be actually categorising it under these things. So our activities, they're usually very well covered. The venue, somewhat less so, though if you're having it in a formal sporting arena or something, you can make some assumptions that the venue must have passed council inspection or building regulations. So it would be fair to outline in your plan uh, that you would make that presumption. But obviously you would talk to the landlords and make sure that that presumption is correct. 
Um, and from an access and egress point of view, you have to sort of think then of crowds coming in, vehicles, and how to get people out. Now, getting people out is at the end of your event, but also in an emergency. So that's where the emergency contingencies arise. So your original part of your um, risk assessment um, list that you would have in your plan, like your risk register, would have all the things that you identified that might concern you. And then that would be what we call the initial risk assessment. Then you would analyse them uh, against a set of criteria that you would have for your organisation. And then you would determine the level of risk and whether you need to treat it or not. So there's a, a section called analysing risks in the um, spreadsheet that we sent out to you. Now, as you can see here, and it's not easily to read on the screen, but you should have this in a handout that we sent you that looks slightly different from this. But I've just put the colours on there for you to understand. I'll just go through it for those of you that may not have it. Now, at the top, you actually have got descriptions of the impact or the consequences that a risk might have. So in this particular one, we have things like a financial impact, which means a financial um, loss to the organisation or the individual. Remember we talked in the liability about somebody um, sustaining a loss. Well, it, it can be about finances and it could be about other damages physically. So that's what we're looking for in the first two columns. We're looking for financial loss and an impact on health. The third column is about your reputation. The fourth one being about the operation of the event. Can the event continue? And the fifth one is about the environment. And the two aspects of the environment are, one is about the physical environment and the other is about environmental legislation. Now, certainly in an environment, for example, if you were going to have a fireworks display and you were setting off fireworks in the middle of a, a fire ban and you set fire to things, uh, you certainly would be having more than just an environmental problem on your hands, you'd be having some legal issues due to compliance as well. So that's first the sort of consequence categories and then you've got to actually look at the level of those and down the side we've got other descriptions such as insignificant, low, medium, high and extreme. So if we talk about the health uh, column of that, the second one, just to give you an example of how this works, we would say that there'll be no injuries, there'd be an ins insignificant risk. Yes, it might be an inconvenience, but there's going to be no injuries. It goes through the spectrum to low being first aid treatment, the third one being medical treatment, the fourth one death or extensive injuries, and the fifth one multiple deaths or severe permanent disabilities. So you can see that you've actually got a scale through there so when people say, well, it's a risk, you would pick up this chart and say to them, well, at what level is the risk? What will be the consequences if something happens? And at what level of risk are we at? So you would go along the top and you'd say, well, OK, somebody might need to have a Band-Aid put on their fingers. So that would be, OK, it's a low risk. How likely is that going to happen? Well, you know, we've checked every year when we have our first aid tent and we give out lots of Band-Aids, so it could happen quite often. So we then start to say, well, OK, if it happens quite often but it's a low risk, at the end of the day it's still a low to medium exposure, so we'll just make sure we've got the first aid in place and that's OK. When you start looking at the bigger picture things of somebody who might get killed, the likelihood of it happening is very high, then there's more treatments that need to be put in place. So you're following that along on the next slide here with the likelihood of it happening. Uh, there's a scale for that which is almost certain it's going to happen more than once a year. Likely it will happen at least once a year, possible at least once in three years, unlikely at least once in 10 years and rare less than once in 15 years. Now those figures are not prescribed, this is just a recommendation to say you need somewhere to start. So when you're talking about the finances of these things, if, if you're a small organisation and the most that you could possibly lose without sending your organisation bankrupt, you might say that an extreme risk to you might be $10,000. The uh, scale we've put on here is $150,000, but this is after insurance. So just remember that the, the risks on these are what we call a residual risk. So when um, you've had your insurance paid out and everything else, it's financial exposure after all these sort of things. So when you're um, having a look at that, you'll say, with your Band-Aid one, how likely was somebody to cut themselves at an event? Well, we decided that it was probably going to happen more than once a year. So it's very likely, um, almost certain. But the outcome was, was just first aid treatment. It was low. So if you follow that matrix up, that would continue to be a low risk. 
so we're not going to really worry too much about putting anything more than what we've done. So every one of your risks that you've identified in that previous thing, you need to take through this process to identify the high to extreme risks that you really need to put treatments in place for. When you do your risk management plan, you're actually going to then outline the high to extreme risks that you got treatment for. You don't necessarily have to put all of the risks that you've identified if you can actually treat them by just routine processes and having things in place. So in your risk management plan, you would be saying, these are the significant risks that we've identified. All other risks are being treated by routine procedures. And then that will mean instead of having a risk management plan that's about 19 pages long, you might only need a risk management plan of a couple of pages. So when you come to treat the risks, we start to say then, what am I supposed to do with all of this information? We now have got all these risks that we've identified. We've got this long list. We've gone through our checklist and we've worked out what's high to extreme. Now what? Well, the first thing is don't panic. There's lots of people out there that have done this before. You can actually have a look at other people's plans and see how they may have treated things. You can discuss them amongst yourself. You can ask the experts. Most things that have happened uh, at events or around events have been well documented. But make sure, again, that you just make sure you look at your own circumstances. doesn't mean to say the treatments that other people have used are not valid. It's just that you have to just review them and determine which ones suit you. The other handout or part of that handout that's got that um, chart I've just gone through gives you an example of some of the activity areas that you might actually do in your event. This is not intended to be something that you just copy. It's intended that you have a look and see what generally some other people have put in place and thought about and then you will evaluate it for your own purposes. And it gives you as close to a template as you're going to get in, in this process, and it will allow you to be able to start putting in treatments. As I said, nothing wrong with reviewing other people's plans, um, getting on the internet, uh, researching risk management plans for events, and getting some ideas, and then looking at your local resources and adapting it. That's, that's what we all do. So the most important thing that you're having in this is a strategy which is a plan of action that is actually designed to achieve a particular goal. And in this case, it's about mitigating those risks. So in this section, when I'm looking at my assessment checklist, what I'm looking for here is that you have a set of these, what we call risk tolerance guidelines, like that form that I've gave, given you. If you find that suits your organisation, make sure it becomes part of your organisational policy. And then you can actually attach that into your risk management plan and say, this is what our organisation has agreed. Uh, the tolerance levels that we're going to have and the risk appetite we have to the risks we will accept or not accept. And then that's quite tailored to your organisation. So those documents will be quite useful for you to review, but make sure it goes through a committee um, or whatever process you use and gets adopted as the ones you will use as your baseline. And then you'll build on that for the future, see how they work for you, review it every year with your plan and say, are we on track with this? So I'll be looking for those risk tolerance levels the risk analysis process is demonstrated and that was that, that coloured chart to say that you've got some way of actually determining what each one is. After you've analysed your risks, you will determine them against the criteria, you'll record the identified risks that are not currently treated and then you will come up with a treatment plan. You obviously are going to communicate and consult with people along the way. Now, this is not the area where um, I'm actually at this minute going to talk about communication and consultation, but I just wanted to point out that you won't actually treat these risks alone. You will take some advice in that. So going back to our treatment of risks in our assessment checklist, which we're now on page two of, we have a look and see whether the potential treatments for high to extreme risks are detailed. We make sure they're resourced, so you'll be wanting to put in there that we'll be, need to do X, Y, Z to treat this risk, and it'll be done by this person, and the money will be allocated to do it if, it if there's a cost. And then after you've done all those things and you've put the risks in place, you go back to your analysis chart and you actually say, now that we've got this treatment in place, so we've got our traffic management plan or we've actually got some shade to stop people getting sunburnt or whatever the, the issue is, we've got cords uh, down so nobody trips on them, you will now put the risk analysis over it and say, if we've got all these things in place, what's the likelihood of this risk now happening? And it will be a lot lower because you've actually treated it. So after the, the post-treatment risk analysis is 
supposedly now all going to bring everything back into a low to medium range. If things remain extreme, the only thing you can do is monitor them. And that might be actually by having somebody, if, if it's uh, an area of um, exposure that you can't treat, it might be sort of some water running through a creek or something running through the middle of your event and you're worried about it, you might have somebody standing there as what we call a living signpost. And that, that treatment is, is good enough. So the risk register is then compiled with all of these things in. The risks identified, the pre-treatment risk level, the treatments, the post-treatment risk level and attached to your plan. And that template type document I've given you is a format that you can use to put all those things in place. Okay, and that, that is the critical part of your plan that's usually done well, I must say. So the next part is communication and consultation. And this part is not so well done in most ones that I see. The first thing you have to do is demonstrate that you've got a communication process in place for how you communicate with people before the event. So when you're sending out uh, any sort of forms inviting them to participate, when they are sending things into you um, requesting partic uh, participation or uh, when they're telling you what they're doing, you need to keep that in a very clear record um, somewhere and some format. You also, when you're sending things out, need to make sure your organisational details are on all things that are sent out and they are recorded as well. So that basically comes down to good record keeping for your organisation. Not complex, but just making sure that it's always identified. Emails are saved or copied off and put into a file so that you've got some track record. What you really need uh, critically is an event day communication. This is another area that often breaks down. On the day you need to be able to communicate with people, you'd be wanting to see in a plan that you've got some system set up on the day, whether it's two-way radio, uh, whether it's mobile phones, uh, whether there's a PA system. And whilst mobile phones are good, you have to remember that sometimes there are range issues or that mobile phones go flat, so you have to have a backup system of some form. And everybody needs to know all the key contact details. Often happy, um, a good idea to have a uh, laminated card with all the key contact details on given to all key people so that they've immediately got a contact thing. So we want to see everything written down in there. What do you do about communicating with the right people? Have you got the triple zero numbers, the contact numbers for the local police, the ambulance and all those things with every key member? We also need to see a um, cancellation or contingency plan. What if you have to cancel your um, event in the middle of the event? Heaven forbid that happens sometimes. Or if on the, the night before, the day of, due to weather or other circumstances, you can't actually have your event, how are you going to contact the people that would be coming to your event? And how do you contact your suppliers if there's enough time to tell them um, about their food and all those sort of things? So you have to think about that sort of thing and put it into some sort of plan. And the actual plan itself is often good to have in the appendix. So you make mention that you've got one and actually have a copy in the appendix of your plan, as you would with your communication plan. The, the communication with stakeholders, again, something not really well done. It's often a verbal phone call um, or it might be a chat with somebody or a quick letter exchange. What you're really wanting to do with them is to actually advise them of what you expect from them, find out what their expectations are of you and have all of the contact details and make sure their responsibilities are listed in the plan and that they also have a copy of the plan to know what you expect from them. Um, the other thing that is, again, not well handled often is you need a copy of all of your stakeholders that are participating in the event of their insurance uh, for their own organisation. It's very often listed that it's their responsibility, but it's your responsibility to get evidence that they've taken their responsibility. And that's the area where you could become liable if they haven't got insurance in place. Uh, then the onus might fall back to you. But you also want to think that if anybody gets hurt or has a loss on the day, that you've made sure that the people participating in your event are looking after those people coming to the event as well through some sort of insurance. Okay, and the other last part about it is in context to the size, location and nature of the event, the local and state authorities need to be notified of what's going on and to determine any compliance or best practice issues that need to take place. Sometimes events go through several different local governments and uh, especially if it's a rally or something like that. So you do have to make sure that all of the relevant state people are, in, are involved and you comply with all their laws. 
and also the emergency personnel in all of those sort of areas as well need to be advised so that they can make sure they've got staff to respond should they need to. So all that bundled up comes under the assessment of communication and consultation. And in our assessment list, as you'll see, we're wanting to see evidence somewhere that you've considered all these things and put something in place. The next phase of our um, risk management plan is that all important um, monitor and review. So once we've got everybody onto the same page um, in our event, we all know what we're there for, we all know what we're looking at, we need to be looking and making sure it's going okay along the way. So during the process, we have to keep on track. So you have to have somebody out there that is making sure that they're monitoring and reviewing that everything is being attended to. Because we could start writing our project plan at the beginning and have all good intent, but unless somebody is actually monitoring as you go along to make sure that you're actually doing everything, you could come to an event day and suddenly find that things are missing. So that's, that's the first part of monitor and review, which is the live one. The second one is actually at the end of the event when we're closing the cycle. We've done the planning, we've done the monitoring, we've done the evaluation, and then we're going to sit down and review what actually happened in all of those cycles. And that's where the continuous improvement part comes in and allows us to see that you've actually got the intent to not only have your event, but to make sure that your event gets bigger and better every year and safer. And so review is important that you'll be actually writing down something in the very beginning about your intent and then through the process of your communication and your consultation you'll have a, a program somewhere listed in there as how you're going to monitor things as the event planning progresses how the event goes on the day and what happened post event so that should be written somewhere in your plan that we'll be looking for and that will be ticked off in that section of the checklist most important as i say is the continuous improvement the last section on your plan is emergency response. Now, emergency response gets quite a lot of airplay in uh, making sure that we've got things um, set up and we've got a traffic management plan. We've got, so if a big emergency happens, we're right there and we can mostly respond. And the details are usually fairly well provided. You should be having a site plan uh, attached to your event if it's a, a large area. You should also be having a traffic management plan um, the details of the emergency um, response crew of your team. So if an emergency arises, who is accountable for it? The one that we think is less um, well managed is what happens if something occurs in the middle of an event? You, you can suddenly have um, extreme weather circumstances. You could have an outbreak of a fire somewhere in there. You could have a crowd panic track. Uh, a tent could blow down, all sorts of things. There's often a lot of uncertainty in events as to who is supposed to be making the call of whether to call off the event, halt things, do whatever. So a reasonable amount of time needs to be spent on documenting and considering the three different levels of emergencies. So an emergency, uh, medical emergencies are really important to have covered off. If you're in a remote area and you need to have some uh, medical response, you may be including the Royal Flying Doctor Service to make sure that they've got a plane in the vicinity if you've got a large event going on uh, at there. There have been issues where that hasn't been the case and there have been some extreme outcomes from that. If you're in the city and close to medical emergencies, that's lesser so, but you should probably know where your nearest accident and emergency is and have all the details and such like. Other emergencies that take place, as I say, are usually to do with um, stage collapse, building collapse, tent blows down, um, weather, all of those sort of things. They're usually covered fairly well in these sort of things. And it's really just about allocating responsibility for those things. But they're not used often, but when they are used, they really are critical that the timing is there. And remember, whenever an emergency response crew comes to your event, they immediately take charge of the event until they hand the event back to you. So it wouldn't be bad to just put that sort of comment in so that all your volunteers and all of people know that you understand the responsibilities that the state authorities have. And in your communication plan, of course, you need to make sure that they're aware of what's going on at your event, how to get in and out so your site plan becomes very relevant because um, they've got to get in and out of an event. And uh, one event that I uh, observed at one stage was that they'd got done a fantastic emergency management plan and it was a BMX event, and when they had to get an, an ambulance in there, the gateway wasn't wide enough for the ambulance to go through to actually get to the victim. 
So you, you just need to make sure that all those things are covered in your emergency response plan. And uh, as we've mentioned, the traffic management plans um, are usually done by a third party and it's quite okay to just actually get a summary from them or to put the link to the plan uh, into yours. So when we come to the end of it, you'll see that on the chart there that there is an overall summary. So you want the assessment that says that you've demonstrated commitment to risk management in your organisational um, information at the beginning, that you followed the principles and practices of AS, NZS, ISO 31000, and you've demonstrated a commitment to continuous improvement. So those three, the, the mandate at the first place, the principles and practices, and the commitment to continuous improvement are all part of the, uh, the standard that shows that you understand what you're doing. And that's why it's not a compliance standard because it has to be a living, breathing thing and throughout your whole document. So you can't get a third party to just come down and do it for you. It's got to be in your organisation. So I promised you at the beginning of, the, of this um, broadcast that I would tell you what a good risk management plan is. And in my view, it's one that you can understand and you can own. So if I'm talking to somebody about a risk management plan and they bring out a plan and I would say, I would take it from them and say, tell me what's the key points in this. You should be able to outline the majority of the content of yours in a few short words, really, and through that plan. You shouldn't have to reread it because you should be living and breathing it. It should give guidance to all stakeholders. So if anybody wants to know what's going on in your event, you should be able to give them the risk management plan and they will understand who's involved, what's going on, and uh, who you are what the event's intending to do and all of the risks that you've identified. People will be taking um, a fair amount of assurance that you've got your risk management under control, but they really want to know that you've got your own organisation under control. It will help you if a liability occurs and it'll give assurance to the grant funders of this matter as well, because don't forget they could be involved in a third party liability if you haven't got your ducks lined up as well. And it lists all the other participants for the future. It gives clear guidelines also for anybody that's coming behind you and who's having to organise the future events because they will see all of the things that they need to come. So it forms a learning platform for future people on your committee or in your organisation. It should improve each time you do it if you're doing it properly. And it provides a, a record of your governance and management and your commitment. So rather than seeing it as something that is a bit of a pain to do, we should be seeing it as a routine part of our organisational planning for events. And over time, it will become your whole project plan in the main with some documents behind it. And you, you don't have to keep transposing lots of information. You will actually have most of this information in other documents. Now, as far as where you get that information from on the organisation, a lot of people think, oh my goodness, the event's a short way out, I haven't got that. But if you look at the application forms that you've put into your grant funders, more often than not, you've got all of that information in there. So it's only a matter of about bringing it back. So I can't stress enough that the stuff about your own organisation is almost always found in applications and in found in your constitution if you're an incorporated body. So it, it really should be readily at hand. This shouldn't be too hard to put together. And I'm, I'm going to talk to you a bit more about um, where we're going in the future, but I, um, I came across this little cartoon and I thought that this really was uh, a good way to, uh, to think about risk management and events management. And, and it's about happy trails and new adventures because I think an event, each time you do it, is a new adventure. So it says, farewell and farewell and wishing you the very best. And where there is no path, leave a trail. Because I think that that's what's risk management and event planning is all about what you do. So this um, here brings us to the end of our session. And in summarising what we've covered, it's just a matter of ensuring that your organisation has sound governance and management processes in place, just like any business and any organisation should. And I'm fairly sure that all of you probably have got that, you just don't think about it very often. You need to determine your event context, soundly put planning into your event, with clearly outlined roles and responsibilities of your organisation and any organisation that participates with you. You need to list your significant identified risk and treatments and ensure you have the right communication processes and insurance in place. And don't forget your emergency response and contingency plans for the middle of the event, 
or the end of the event or any other time during an event. Each plan must be developed and the term that the risk management industry use is fit for purpose, meaning that it's just yours about your event. But by all means, have a look at other people's and get ideas from them because nothing's new in under the sun, it just needs to be relevant to your event. The most important factor is your record keeping and the ability to produce information should it be needed in the event of any issues arising. And as I said, it's an orientation tool for anybody that comes behind you to be able to do a plan. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation today and have learned useful information to help you in event management and more so what you've learned over the duration of these Westlink broadcasts. It's been my pleasure to support you with information to help you reduce risks and enhance your events and I hope you continue to make a difference to the well-being of your communities for a long time to come. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>